Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to this prestigious campus and uh, I would like to make some just survey of what the geometry can be used to help about some problem of tensors and mainly about the identifiability problem. Uh, sorry that I will spend the first slides to introduce some notation and this may be is something that everybody knows but let me start very quickly and this is the plan of the talk and so what is a tensor everybody knows what is a tensor but <coughs> say why use this kind of objects from my point of view the idea is that you use matrices when you want to relate to two different sets and you need to use tensors when you relate three or more sets and my definition the first piece of notation is that I uh, will indicate with simple a tensor which is a tensor product of uh, elements of vectors essentially this is the, uh, uh, the notation that I will use and the idea is that if the tensor uh, is uh, something which gives some statistical connection among variables then simple means that the variables are independent so uh, well let's see that the set of simple tensor is a cone but this is not a subspace and this is exactly where all the story starts and it spans the whole space of tensors so everything can be written as a sum of simple tensors and this is the definition of rank that we saw in the previous talk so the rank of a tensor is exactly as everybody knows uh, let me call the summation of TIs is a decomposition of the tensor so I will use the word decomposition both to indicate the sum and also to indicate every sum and just say that if you use this definition of tensor this is a, a way to measure the complexity of a tensor in the sense that if you have a tensor of high rank this imply many tensors of right rank imply many connections among the variables so why use algebraic geometry related to tensors well, many interesting set of tensors are defined by algebraic equations uh, let's say at least aside some uh, small set and so you use uh, this fact and since you have algebraic equations then the first thing to look at is what happens over an algebraically closed field because the general nonsense is that algebraic equations are easier when you have an algebraically closed field so from this point of view uh, tensors of real numbers are considered at the second level of difficulty so we first start and see what happens in the complex case and all what I'm going to say is over the complex field the second idea is that well many interesting sets of tensors as simple tensors are cones and so uh, cones means that I, they are defined by homogeneous polynomials and so it's natural to factor out the sister action this maybe is one big difference between people coming from geometry and people coming from uh, statistics because usually what you do when you look at statistics you may take a normalization of everything and you just put the condition that the summation of all probabilities is one what we do in geometry is just we don't care about scaling a tensor so we take everything uh, factoring out the sister action and so we go to consider tensors as parts <coughs> in the projective space and more or less the two procedures are the same so let me take the point of view of projective geometry uh, so uh, what is important about our knowledge of tensors we take the point of view of rank so what we would like to know for generic tensor of given rank is to know the dimension of the variety we will see that of course everybody knows that tensors of a given rank define a projective variety so find the dimension find equations find how many minimal decompositions a general tensor has and this is exactly the, what I will call the identifiability problem and for specific tensor you would like to compute the rank of a given tensor or find how many minimal decompositions a given tensor has and this is again the identifiability problem for a specific tensor and 
of course, find the decomposition of the, the decompositions because they could be more than one of a given tensor. And I will talk both for the generic case and the specific case. And essentially, I apologize that the word generic in general will be synonymous in this talk. OK, so. Uh, OK, so what is the interpretation of rank? The interpretation of rank in the projective world is by means of secant varieties. Let me start from a geometrical point of view, take any variety in projective space. And let me start with the abstract secant variety, which is just the correspondence of points. P1 to Pk are points in your original variety X, and Q is something in the span, the linear span of P1 up to Pk. This is the abstract construction. And you have, of course, a projection to the last factor. And this projection can be used to define the secant varieties that you have, I mean, different kind of definitions. You can define the strict secant variety, which is just the image of the map. And so is, the, is defined as the set of points such that you find independent points in X with P belong, uh, oh sorry, this is, should be Q, belongs to the span of P1 up to PK. And the secant variety is the Zariski closure. So you, you can think of this as the usual closure of the strict K secant variety. Uh, so what is the relevant picture with tensors? If you take X to be the set of simple tensors, then being a point of the two secant variety means that your original your tensor is something of rank two, and you define rank three as being a point in the plane spanned by three simple tensors and so on. So the geometric interpretation is that you start with the variety of simple tensors. And what is the geometrical interpretation of the variety of simple tensors? You take uh, points of the sacred product of projective spaces. And the main fact is that, as I told you at the beginning, the product of many projective spaces is not a linear space. It can be embedded in a bigger projective space, Pn. And the image is called the sacred embedding from the geometric point of view. So, say the uh, rank 1 tensors are points in the sacred embedding of X, and rank, rank, K, rank K tensors are points in the street K secant variety of the sacred embedding. And for points belonging to the secant variety, there is the definition of border rank, which roughly speaking means that they are limit of rank K tensors, and these are points of the K secant variety. So what is the geometric translation of our problems? The problem of finding the dimension of the variety of tensors of given border rank is exactly find the dimension of a secant variety of sacred varieties. And find equations for secant varieties of sacred varieties. And find the decompositions for find k points on the secret variety which span a given point p inside the, uh, the secant sigma k of x, and study the identifiability, find how many sets of k points of the secret variety span a given set, a given point p in the secret space. And we will focus on this problem. Oh, uh, let's say that in my setting, how many here, well, I started with the product of x k times, so how many <coughs> here means mod permutations. Of course, you can permute the your set of simple tensors giving a given P. And so I will always talk about mod permutations, and both for the generic and specific case. So let's see what happens for a generic tensor or given rank or for a specific given tensor. What is the main uh, structure for understanding problems on the uh, secant variety? Well, the main lemma is that still the Teorachini's lemma which tells us what is a tangent space at the general point of the uh, secant variety. And this is exactly the tangent space is the span of tangent spaces to x at given point p1 up to pk of the decomposition. It's interesting to see the proof of the Rachinus lemma because some ideas of the proof can be used later. And this is the proof. 
in the sense that, of course, moving a point P inside the secant variety means that you want to move the two points of the decomposition. And moving infinitesimally the two points of the decomposition means that you take the two tangent vectors at the two points of the decomposition. Of course, you can also move P along the secant line, but altogether this gives us the, uh, the definition of the span of the two tangent spaces at the two points of the decomposition. Well, another proof is more technical, but it's very easy. Uh, the absolute secant variety is locally a product, so it's easy to understand what is the tangent space to this uh, abstract secant variety points. And the map AK, the projection to the last factor, is generically smooth, which means that the uh, tangent space is set uh, isomorphically downstairs. And this is another way to understand what the meaning of general point is in the original statement of Teresini's lemma which could be relevant if you want to look at some specific tensors. Well, the Regine's lemma is usually applied as a method to compute the dimension of a secant variety. And uh, let's say that from now on, I uh, assume that the dimension of my secant variety is uh, the expected value and also that this value is smaller than the dimension of the ambient space so the secant variety is not filling, is not the ambient space and I will refer to this as the non-defective case this is something uh, let, let's take this just as a piece of notation but what is less uh, known is that Terracini's lemma can be used also to detect the <coughs> identifiability of general tensors. And why is that? Uh, for generic non-identifiability, assume that you have, I mean, more than one decomposition for the general tensor. I can show that what happens in a picture. So <coughs> for a general tensor, you have several decompositions. Okay. Now what happens? If you move your general tensor along the secant space, then you find that the new tensor still has more than one decomposition. So you get that this movement determines other secants all of them passing through the new points. But now what happens from Terracini's point of view? The tangent spaces at all points in the picture are the same in the sense that the span of the two tangent spaces at these two points is the same as the span of the tangent spaces at these two points and the same of the tangent spaces at these two points. Because the tangent space to the secant variety does not change when you move your point along uh, a secant space. And so you see that what happens is that if, as you move your point in the secant space, you get infinitely many decompositions all having the same tangent space. And this is the main tool for understanding what happens from this point of view. The tool is that you get what is called a contact locus. What is a contact locus? A contact locus is the, say that, comes from this remark. If a general tensor of a given rank is not identifiable, then the general space which is tangent to points P1 up to PK, K is 2 in the picture, defines really is indeed tangent at infinitely many points the one in the uh, orange set and they define a subvariety, an algebraic subvariety. Okay. Is identifiable unique decomposition up to trivialities? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's exactly my definition. Up to permutation yeah. And so you get this contact locus. And the geometry of this contact locus will be helpful in understanding what happens for tensors. Uh, first remark, contact loci have the property that they are containing many hyperplanes. If you look at the local geometry of this contact loci, you see that there are many derivatives that must vanish along this contact loci, so they are containing many hyperplanes. They are highly degenerate. What is, this is the uh, usual word 
used in the algebraic geometry to uh, indicate that something is contained in a space of small dimension. And so, you have a way to control what happens, and this is indeed the original idea of Severi in proving that the uh, Veronese variety is the unique variety for surface for which tangent spaces in two different points, general points, meet. And the idea is that if you have a counted locus of dimension m, then this counted locus spans a subspace of at most that dimension. But the main remark is that generic non-identifiability is strictly related with the existence of highly degenerate sub-varieties passing through k general points. So you have both a way to prove that uh, something is identifiable if you can prove that there are no degenerate sub-varieties passing through general points, or if you have such kind of degenerate sub-varieties, you have a hint how to look at for finding examples of non-general identifiability. Let just use the second approach in order to prove that something is not generically identifiable. Uh, the first object that I would like to present is that look that a tensor of type 2 by 2 by 2 five times. Well, general tensors of this type are not identifiable. And why is, what is the reason? Well, they have exactly two decompositions, two different decompositions. And how you can prove that? Well, I have a geometric way to prove this. And the geometric proof, of course, if you try to make experiments, you find that you find exactly that there are two decompositions, but this is not a proof. Well, a proof can be given by showing that through five general points of that segre product, one can draw an elliptic normal curve of degree 10. And why is the reason that this is a proof? Because since through five general points, there are only two in the picture, but the idea is the, the same, you find this elliptic normal curve. For a lipid number curve, we know everything about secant varieties. And we know that the general point of the span of the lipid normal curve is contained in two different secant spaces. And so this means that if you take a general point of the secant variety of P1 cross P1 cross P1, this is contained in the secant variety of the lipid normal curve, but you have two different decompositions in the lipid normal curve, so you have uh, two different decompositions in the... Uh, uh, in, uh, P1 cross P1 five times, and the theory gives you that exactly two decompositions. So is what this, you this is a proof that you have exact, at least two. How do you no, know? no, no, no. The point is that, of course, this is not obvious from this picture. But what you find out is that every decomposition, for a general tensor, every decomposition must be one of these. So you find, because otherwise you would have another, another elliptic curve, and this is false. So for general tensor, you can find out that there are exactly that number of decompositions. But of course, you have to compute something in the sense that sorry, you have to prove that through uh, that number of points, you find exactly one uh, elliptic curve. But the elliptic curve must be contained in the contact locus. You compute the contact locus at a given set of points and you realize that the dimension is 1, so you have just one elliptic curve, and this is enough to say that there are no other decompositions, and this is enough. Okay, let me see another statement. Look at general tensor of rank 6 and type 4 by 4 by 4. Even in that case, you find non-generic identifiability. So, indeed, they have exactly two decompositions. And once again, all the stuff is to prove the existence of an elliptic normal curve. A elliptic normal curve are really something which, appear, uh, which appears a lot of time in uh, these kind of computations. Uh, almost all examples that I know of generic non-identifiability are related with the existence of elliptic normal objects, except one example that I will show you later. And even in that case, you find an example. Look, I mean, these are quite, I mean, small cases in which, well, 
talking about tensor, this is a 4 by 4 by 4 tensor. If you look at three variables with four states, and you look at the matrix of these <coughs> uh, three variables, they could be three positions in the DNA chain, and you find uh, uh, something of general object of rank 6, which means that you have six different kind of uh, I mean, kind of DNAs, and you look at three positions, you cannot divide the tensor in the three original tensors giving you the, uh, your object because you have exactly two possibilities for that. So it sounds like, uh, it sounds odd, but it turns out that this is an example. What about rank four? Four by four by four rank four, that's of course the... For four by four by four, and rank four, of this is covered by other kind of theorems. So 6 is exactly the case that you do not know. I mean, if you look, for instance, there are other kind of, I will talk this, about this later, there are other kind of, these are uh, negative uh, results. I show you some positive results. And if you look, for instance, at Krusko, uh, I mean, criterion, then this is covered by Krusko criterion for generic tense, but not for a specific one, of course. Can you? Uh, let me mention that the existence of a contact locus unfortunately does not necessarily imply the non-identifiability. It's a little bit more complicated. The existence of an elliptic curve as a contact locus imply, implies the non-identifiability, but this is false. For instance, if your contact locus is what is called a KOASS, which is one apparent double point, which means that the, contact, the, the, the general point in the span of the contact locus is containing just one sequence space, and there are varieties which are known to be this kind of objects, rational normal curves, general arrangements of linear spaces, and we know everything about OASS surfaces. If your contact, so having a contact locus is not enough to decide that the uh, tensor, is, the general tensor is not identifiable. You need to know that the contact locus is not of this type, and elliptic curves, curves are not of this type, so you can conclude. And indeed, if your contact locus is an OASS, then the converse holds. In that case, if the contact, the contact locus is really responsible for giving the decompositions. All the decompositions come from the contact locus. So if the contact locus has more than one decomposition, as in the case of elliptic curve, elliptic curves, then you know that the general identifiability fails. But if the contact locus is an OASS, then X is generically. Sorry. Sorry. This, you're missing a, uh, so X is K generically identifiable, or? Yes. That's the statement. K oh. generically identifiable. Okay. Sometimes K is missing in some statement, apologize for that. Uh, let me also mention, before going to positive results, that there is a bound for what you can find out with this uh, stuff of contact loci. And the fact is that there is a maximum for which you can imagine to uh, understand identifiability, and the maximum is given from that formula where n is the dimension of the segregate variety and uh, capital N is the dimension of the total space of tensors. And the reason for that is that when you take the projection from the abstract secant variety, if the dimension of the abstract secant variety is bigger than the dimension of the target space, of course, the fiber cannot finite. And so, I mean, you have a maximum number for identifiability. And for this, this maximal number, you can compute this number quite easily. This is the maximum for which you can imagine to have genetic identifiability. And let me uh, say that it may happen that this is a, an integer. And when this is an integer, of course, this is exactly the maximum possible value for genetic identifiability. And unfortunately, we cannot handle with the, K, with the stuff of contact loci we cannot handle, in that case, the maximum value for k, okay? 
so there is some case can, which cannot be uh, by now, let me say by now, cannot be uh, considered from this point of view. But now, uh, let the general nonsense is that when k is small, you have ways to understand what happens for identifiability. When k grows and approaches this maximal value, things become much more complicated. And let's so state positive results in terms of how far are you from this maximal value. So, uh, yes. For k bigger than this number, is it not identifiable? Well, it depends because essentially, I mean, it, it, you cannot use this kind of these kind of arguments, essentially. So, this so, is the, the, so the, the contact locus cannot be used. That's the point. Yes. Of course, you may imagine. I have no examples of identifiable cases where the rank is bigger than the maximal border rank. If you have one, please tell me. <laughs> That's, so, I mean, but in principle, it may happen that you have only one decomposition if the rank is bigger than the maximal possible border rank. Why not? I mean, sounds, sounds really strange, but it could happen. And, you cannot use this kind of method to understand what happens in this situation. So let's see what happens for the first case. Take tensor type 2 by 2 by 2, a certain number of times. Here k max is that number there. Theorems about this situation. Well, for defectivity, everything is known. The dimension of the second varieties are always what you expect. But let's look what happens for identifiability. Well, there is a result by 2005 saying that such product is identifiable when the number of factors is much bigger than the, than the rank. Okay? And you can refine this. There is a refinement by Allman, Matthias, and Rhodes saying a precise <coughs> boundary for, bound for how much is S is bigger than K. And this is what they find, which is about the square root of k max divided by 2. Using contact loci, you find a sharper result, which is that k is less or equal than essentially the maximal value divided by 2. And if you refine the method of uh, uh, contact loci, you are much, much closer to the maximal value. This is the original statement, and with new ideas for computations, you can get even closer, and maybe the now, if you just let your computer run, then you can get much, much closer, but I will show you why. And just to mention, oh, maybe the, should I go back? This is close. And just to mention, the method for the first result in this setting is quite easy. If you use the non, uh, the fact that something is not defective, and you use the translation of this fact in the setting of contact loci, then it's almost immediate to see that you get the uh, k max divided by two, and this is always true essentially. But in order to refine that, well, there are other sharper things that you can do. For instance, you can try to use some inductive procedure. Uh, so, an idea is to consider the product of P1s as a family of products, one factor less, and as parameterized by P1. This is the idea. Okay, so let's consider the last factor as, as a base for a family. And then you push the k points to the two copies of the smaller product, and you want to use induction. If you know everything about s minus 1 copies, then you can try to push what you know for s minus 1 copies to the higher situation, just in order to prove that there is no contact locus. Then assume that you know that there is no contact locus for s minus 1 copies, and you want to push this further. You can do that, except that, of course, contact locus means here to be tangent to the smaller product, and you have to know what happens if you go to the bigger product. You have to control what happens. This can be done because the structure 
of a circuit product that is locally indeed quite easy to understand. And if you do that, you find out. This is a, a method introduced for the defectivity by Abo, Ottaviani, and Peterson. Okay? And this is uh, how you get this result. Let me just explain the, uh, this uh, strange number appearing over there. Well, it depends just on the, your initial step. Because you know that for five copies, you have not generic identifiability. So what is the initial step? You can do something by looking at six copies, seven copies, and so on. And you have to do that by hand, just using a computer to prove that there is no contact locus. And you can do that to some extent. And if you use 10 copies of P1, the best that you can do is that you arrive to this strange factor, of course. This is, these are powers of two. And uh, if you do that for via a computer algebra package, one may be that with a large computer you can go a little bit further, but things become really odd. And you need some new idea. And using a different approach that we'll explain in minutes, then you can get even closer to the whole range. I should say that it would be great to have a complete uh, description for the case of many copies of P1, but unfortunately we are not able to do the last step. So at any time that you have a uh, base for your induction, then you lose something, and what you lose is exactly the remaining uh, coefficient that you see there. Uh, of course, these two results together uh, suggest the conjecture that the case of five copies of P1 is exactly the last case of many copies of P1 in which you get generic non-identifiability. And for tensors of type A cross B cross C, some known result is Kruskal's theorem. Everybody knows about Kruskal's theorem, people working in this kind of uh, problem. And there is a bound which is almost linear, say, in terms of the rank. and in terms of A, B, and C. Uh, in the unbalanced case, you can do much better. The unbalanced case is the case where, uh, essentially, <coughs> this means that C is much bigger than A and B, if you look at it carefully. And there are other kind of uh, results in this setting. But let's see what happens if you use the uh, the process of contact loci in order to find results in this setting. And for uh, contact, well, for let's say geometric, let's say uh, what happens if you use some geometric tool. Then there is this paper by Strassen, famous paper by Strassen, in which at a certain point it says that using geometric ways and make some computations. And these computations are really very algebraic. So you may wonder why you have a geometric. He says that this is a geometric way to produce a kind of result. And what he produces in the case is that K identifiability holds for odd C and this bound here. Oh, sorry. Which is very close to the maximal value. Really very close. And indeed, you can interpret the Strassen's original argument in terms of contact loci, and indeed maybe this, is, this was exactly what he had in mind in writing down this kind of theorem. And if you do that in terms of contact loci, you see immediately that there is no point in uh, uh, saying that C must be odd. For any C, you find the C exactly the same bound. And for the unbalanced case, when C is much bigger than you have other kind of statements, still using contact loci that you can draw immediately in that case, if unbalanced, unbalanced is not so clear what is the meaning of unbalanced. Let's say that this is a definition which is different from the definition of Delotover and Domanov. But in that case, we have a complete description, if and only if, or generic identifiable. And say that in the balanced case, you, we have a complete picture up to uh, this product, up to is 50,000, maybe, maybe even more, because uh, 
computers are running. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me give another example of non-identifiability. And the examples are tensors of rank 8 and tile 3 by 6 by 6. In this case, they have six different decompositions, the general tensor of that type. And the contact locus now is not an elliptic curve, but is much more complicated. It has a product, it's another second product embedded in the original second product by a strange divisor. And it's not clear to me, you, you can compute and you find that there is this contact locus. You, you find this from your computer for a specific case, then you have to prove this in general, you can do that. But don't ask me why in this particular case there is this strange sub-variety here, what is the meaning? Sorry. An elliptic curve is quite clear. Is it really 113, not 311? No, 3 it's 311, yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. In, yes, awesome. in this setting is 112. So it tends to type 2, 2, 3. Yeah. Sorry, no, this is related to... No, it's the, the divisor is bothering me because the P2 should have a different embedding then the P, two P1 should have the same embedding. Mm -hmm. So that they should be the ones if the uh, one three is correct. Because no, otherwise. No, 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 no. no. So how no, is this one is, P1 playing a, how is one I can C6 show you the proof, but the I mean you see that you can embed one one with P1 cross P2 and one one with P1 cross P2, and then P2 itself, though this means that three is related to P2. Okay, and you do that. So the point is that this tree is related to P2. Yeah, that's, that's what I want. Okay, yeah. yes, yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm happy. it was wrong, right? <laughs> okay, oh. And there is strong, I don't know how many decompositions are there. In that case, there is strong evidence by computer that there are exactly six decompositions, but in this case, I cannot prove it. Is this the maximum possible value for tensors of type A cross B cross C for which you have not identifiability for general tensors? I don't know. There are evidence for that. And everything here can be rephrased when you take more factors. So you have a formula, let's say what happens for the very balanced cubic case, you have a formula which is about some uh, fraction of the maximal value, and for the unbalanced case you have still an if and only if still using contact law side. Let me uh, point out some computational aspect. How you can produce this kind of results? So how you can go up to this number here and up to this number here? Well, a way to do that is to look at the contact locus. And of course, if the contact locus is positive dimensional, you have a tangent space to the contact locus. So if you can prove that there is no tangent space to the contact locus, then you can prove that the contact locus cannot exist. And this is the way you you, you can perform these computations because usually when you take a second product, being tangent means that you contain the uh, coordinate spaces and you can prove and you can try to show what happens if you extend this property to uh, infinitesimally closed points. And this happens to be, you make computations and what you find out is this, what is called the stack addition matrix which is a block matrix where Q is any linear equation for a k-tangent space. You start with the k-tangent space in a set of points and look at uh, any linear equations. And this UI sage are local coordinates for any copy of your coordinate spaces inside the second product. So it's a very linear algebraic kind of matrix that you can, can, uh, can consider. And if the rank of the stack addition is maximal for all possible equations Q of your K tangent space, at one point of the decomposition of a general tensor, then you find that generic K identifiability holds because there is no uh, contact locus in that case. And now computations can be performed by linear algebra, and they're much faster than in the case of uh, 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 symbolic algebra packages. And this is why you can go up to 50,000. Uh, for specific tensors, 
Well, for specific tensors, you have a way use, to use contact loci even for specific tensors. But except that you need one more condition. And why is that? This is due to the Zariski main theorem. Assume that T is a smooth point of the second variety. If the general fiber is given by permutation, so it's trivial, so this means that the generic tensor is identifiable, and some fiber at some specific point is not a singleton model of permutations, which means that some specific tensor is not identifiable by this risky main theorem, the general fi uh, the fiber over T is positive dimensional, so at your T a contact locus exists. And so, and so what you do is that if you can say that your original tensor is smooth inside the second variety, then the stack additions give you uh, a computation for identifiability. Let me give an example. Take this tensor of type phi by phi by phi. You can compute this. This is a smooth point of the second variety because fortunately you know many local equations of that second variety. And so you compute the tangent space at those equations, and this is the same dimension. So what you get is that this is a smooth point, and now you compute the stack addition, and you find the identifiable. Let me just observe that this tensor is beyond cross cross range. Uh, surely, what happens for symmetric tensor? You can use stack additions for symmetric tensor, and to find symmetric identifiability, which is the, the compositions in symmetric tensors of rank one. And there is a new example of non-general identifiable tensors that came out from stack additions computations. And this is the case, and once again, uh, uh, this is due to the existence of the contact locus, which again is a elliptic normal curve. Let me say that this is not well known in the sense that, well, the ex classically they had all the ingredients to compute that, except that they did not, did not observe that the general cubic of rank 9 had, had that structure. And so in certain sense, this is something new. And for symmetric tensors, we know ev almost everything, because there is a theorem by Ballico for generic identifiability that says what happens when you have more than uh, uh, three copies of your tensors. And for matrices, of course, matrices are almost never, uh, they are almost never defective, so identifiability cannot hold. And so it remains to understand what happens for three copies, which means cubics. And for cubics, we know almost everything uh, except for one case. And, uh, See that this is what we promise. And if you uh, may, I have one minute more. Sure. This yeah. is the last slide. Yeah. And in the last slide, let me other, uh, open some other perspectives of using geometry for understanding tensors. One is a systematic study of singularities of second varieties, at least in the case of segregate varieties, which means homogeneous varieties. You cannot control singularities of second varieties in general because everything may happen. But for very homogeneous spaces, like segregate varieties, you may hope to have a description of the singular locus. Together with the stack addition, we give a condition for computing the identifiability of the test. Uh, then, let me mention that for the case of symmetric tensor, there are methods for detecting the identifiability. This is, would be another talk. So, I mean, I don't want to enter there, but if you look carefully and you use carefully the Hilbert function, then there are papers by Landsberg and uh, Buzinski, there are papers by Balik and Bernardi, and probably I, my, my feeling is that the uh, full strength of the Hilbert function has not yet been used to uh, write down uh, uh, theorems of uh, what happens for identifiability of symmetric tensors, even for specific symmetric tensors. But this is work in progress, too. And then you can look at identifiability of linear systems of tensors. So you take a linear system of tensors, and you want to take the simultaneous decompositions of the elements. And this can be studied still with this method of contact locus, because it can be rephrased in terms of the identifiability of bigger tensors. And then there is another point. You can def change your definition of simple tensors. Simple tensors for rank one. Yes, okay, but why? 
there could be other kind of, the, of simple tensors. For instance, if you look at the symmetric case, simple tensors are powers of linear forms. But if you ask to uh, students of the first year, then a monomial, which is not simple from that point of view, but is very simple at the first sight. I mean, you are very excited when you see uh, a monomial. And then, so you can change your definition of simple tensors, and you can ask the same. And I think that geometric methods for other kind of simple tensors definitions will, are not used uh, at all. And so this is a word of theorems, and that's an important stuff. So the thing is, uh, uh, one possible definition of simple tensors for symmetric tensors is that instead of a power of linear form, you could have, uh, uh, you know, symmetrizers, right? So the sure. rank is the sum. Is there sure. anything known in that case? I, I mean, of course, there are things that are known for their identifiability yeah. because they're general. Okay. But I think that the full strength of what you can do using geometric methods, that, like this method of the counter log, counter log means that you use some differential geometry. You look at the, the infinitesimal deformations, okay? And I think that there is space for finding out other results. This is what I have in mind. But even, for instance, for general, I mean, other cases, of, there is a recent paper by Seth Sullivan about the mixtures of several models of uh, Markov trees. And what happens if you try to understand the identifiability of that mixtures by using contact loci? What is the tangent space of that growth side? Who knows? I mean, I never saw a specific approach from this point of view. And maybe it gives some new results. I see. Bernard? For the non-identifiable case, uh, are there some thing known on the degree or the, well, the dimension? Well, the if, you the have, if, you have the, if you have an elliptic normal curve, you can say the degree is 2. Because you know everything about the degree of an elliptic normal curve, the second degree, or what we call the second order. But for the case, for instance, of tensors of type 3 by 6 by 6, we have the strong feeling that the second order is 6, is uh, uh, six okay? And ex if you try with the computer, Bertini's package is very clever in finding out many decompositions of a given tensor. You find exactly six of them. But this is not enough, of course. It may be that if you let your computer run for one billion of years, he finds another decomposition somewhere. Uh, so uh, essentially, the, 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 the number of different decompositions that you find are the number of different decompositions of the counted logos. So you have just to look at the counted logos, what happens in that case. The counted logos, however, gives you the number. So, in case you have something in, in the generic identifiable case, is it, is it easy to describe what the exceptional set is? So it doesn't not at all. Not at all. For instance, th this is one part of this kind of problem. You expect that when you have singularities, this comes because you have two different points of the absolute second variety patching together when you project them now. But is this possible? What happens in that case? I don't know. So it would be great even to bound, to have equations, just one equation, give me one equation of the locus where your, uh, your set jumps. And unfortunately, this is, this is exactly uh, related to my first question. Can you give some criteria? For the case of uh, symmetric tensors, you have some criteria, saying that in this open subset, you cannot have anything. Because, for instance, if you know a specific decomposition, and you look at the points of the specific decomposition that you have, these are points in the Veronese variety. Go back to your original projective space and look at the Hilbert function of those points. If the Hilbert function of those points is general enough and the rank is not too big, then you can conclude uh, it, it is not even written down in the complete generality. I know. I guess that there are more results on that, but anyway, you can conclude that the <coughs> set of points is, is good. So, for instance, one equation would be that your, there is a one decomposition for which the pre-image in your original projective space has a general Hilbert function. This is for the symmetric case. 
What can be done for the general case? I don't know. What is the analog of the Hilbert function in the non-symmetric case? There is a very recent paper introducing a sort of Hilbert function for the non-symmetric case, but we know very, very small things about what happens in the non-symmetric case. This is some propaganda. I mean, this is a word of theorems. And so, uh, it's a very good point. Do you have a sense whether these results on identifiability could be made robust in the following sense? Suppose you look at tensors over real numbers, mm -hmm. then um, your entries are real. Okay. If you know that, so you have a tensor here, it would be nice to say that you know in a small region around it, decompositions of those are also close to the decomposition. I agree that every problem about commons like conjectures can be easier if you, you if you know identifiability, of course. Because in that case, usually when you have identifiability, it could be easier to understand. If you start with a tensor of a certain type, you want to understand if all the possible decompositions are of that type, and if you have one decomposition, then probably this is a good point. But they have not a general statement about that. However, I, I think that there is something. Is there? Well, but anyway, the if the stack Hessian is maximal rank, this is true on an yes. open subset. Yes, Maybe yes, it was yes, a, mm, mm. yes, for general, for general. I see, so if you proved identifiability via the stack yes. Hessian, then that would automatically imply some kind of robust identifiability? Yes and no. The problem <laughs> is that uh, it depends if your original tensor is general enough. So for instance, it may happen that, well, th th this cannot happen, but anyway, let's see. What happens if you take very specific, over a finite field? <coughs> let's say that all tensors with entries in that finite field are singular points of the second variety. So what? I mean, in that case, you, the stack addition uh, cannot give an answer. You have to know two things, a stack addition of maximal rank and a smooth point of secant. If you have both, then it is it holds in an open subset here. Yeah. So then if I choose my low rank tensor from some distribution, some sort of sufficiently random distribution, then would it... If you believe that this is a smooth point of that. So Kruskal is about 3 over 2. I think uh, with this technique we can arrive at 2 instead of 3 over 2, so a bit more. But uh, there are no e equation of secant variety higher, so... So, look, I mean, assume that you have a point, and you have a decomposition, which means the secant space. <laughs> and if you have some continuous set of decompositions, then the stack addition gives you an answer. But if you have just one decomposition here and another decomposition around Saturn, say, I mean, how can you know that this is not the case? This is a singular point in the second row. So, I mean, your specific tensor in that case is not enough. You have to know that this is not a, secu a singular point. If this is true, then the stack addition can give you an answer. So I should also add that on Friday, we're going to have a, a lot of discussion on identifiability from the machine theoretic right. point of view. And you will probably be interested to come to the talks on Friday. So let's thank uh, Luca again for a wonderful